Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 102 of the weekly playback. So there are a number of games to get through and we will see how many I get through. Um, I'm just getting a huge backlog of games from like weeks ago that I've played that I haven't talked about yet, which I know is not good because then I forget the details. So anyway, um, I will be announcing the Obsession uh, giveaway winner in this video. So maybe if you guys are super curious, you could just skip ahead to that and then come back to the beginning. <laughs> okay, so let's just get into the games that I played uh, in the last week or more and talk about them. Let's talk about Skyrise. Skyrise is a 2024 game for two to four players designed by Gavin Brown, Sebastian Pochon, and Adam Wise. And it's pub uh, the it's illustrated by Andrew Bosley and it's published by Roxley Games. This is not a review copy. This is a game that I backed on Kickstarter and I went all out for all the deluxe components. Um, so I'm going to need to throw up pictures because there's a lot to show you, but basically there's going to be this board. And on this board, you're going to have island pieces which I will show you in a minute and all the islands will be kind of connected to each other um, through staircases and bridges and so on. Um, so here is the center island piece and then there are these other island pieces and then depending on player count you're going to have a certain number of islands on the board. Um, so I played a four player game of this so we had all of the island pieces and again you're just going to slot these into each other and you will see that some will connect to others. Like so for example this brown one will be connected to whatever is on this side by this bridge over here. However this green one will not be connected to whatever is over here because there is no bridge going from this piece to something over there. So again you're going to have a center surrounded by these four islands and within the islands are neighborhoods. So you'll see yellow, white, brown, and uh, green neighborhoods. And some of them border lakes, some of them are separated from each other from by blimps. So for example, this green one is not adjacent to this green one because of this blimp over here. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, so each person is going to have buildings in their own color. And these buildings are just fantastic. So I'm going to show you some examples. So here is a tall building, for example in the red color and each person's also going to have monuments so each person will have one monument so this is the monument for the red player uh, let me show you the monument for the white player because theirs is a cathedral and it is really nice so here is a monument for the white player um, so the player colors are green blue red and white unless that's yellow and i'm calling it white accidentally so these are the monuments for those uh, player colors. So each person is going to have buildings in their own number and you're going to have short buildings, medium sized buildings, and tall buildings. And all of the buildings are going to have numbers on the bottom of them. And so all the small buildings are going to have numbers that are kind of within the same range, so much lower numbers. Like so for example here's one of the small red buildings that has a number 24 on it. And if I picked up a small blue building you'll see that here's one with a number 33 on it. So all the small buildings are going to have numbers within the same range. However the numbers between all the players are not identical. Everyone will have different numbers, but of course it's balanced. So, you know, you're always going to have some kind of a number um, that will be hopefully able to outdo other players within one type of the building. So whether that's small, medium, tall, whatever. Um, but we'll get into all of that, but it's pretty balanced in terms of how the buildings are numbered. So again, you have short, medium, and tall buildings. And then some of the buildings have dots on them. And these ones will not become available until the second era of the game. And I'll talk about how you get to the second era of the game. So this game is played over two eras and it's basically a bidding area control game. So on your turn, you are going to place a building face up and you have to have your buildings face up like this so that everyone can see all the numbers available. So that way you kind of can strategize whether or not you think you want to bid on something or if you want to pass, depending on what numbers people have available to them and what you think someone might want to bid on. But before we get to that, let me just show you the individual player boards. So uh, there are these individual player boards and I'll talk about what everything means, but they are dual layered for the tokens to slot into. And there are just a bunch of different real life architects in this game. So for example, I played as Lena Bobardi, who is a Brazilian architect. So that is who I played as. And she integrated Italian rationalism and American modernism into her work. Her buildings were not designed to create culture, but to enhance and influence it. So I think it's super 
cool like how they use real life architects that existed in history and you get to play as one of them. So that's pretty cool. And then this bag is filled with tokens. And again, I upgraded all the components. So I have the actual wooden pieces, but otherwise you would have cardboard if you did not um, get the deluxe version. Um, I just went all out with this game. Um, and actually there are some cards as well, which I should pull out underneath all of these island pieces. So let me get those ready because we'll need to show those at certain points in the game. So for setup, basically you're going to put out the number of islands necessary for the number of players. So in a four player game, all of the islands will come out. And again, I'll have a picture here. And then you are going to hand each person um, a personal objective card that they will try to meet throughout the game. The personal objective cards are not super interesting, I will say. They basically all just say something along the lines of have four of your buildings on, you know, um, neighborhoods of a certain section, a color. So for example, I had the one that said at the game end, uh, score 10 if you have four or more structures on inventor brown neighborhoods. So all of the personal objectives give you some kind of neighborhood that you want your buildings on. So those are not super interesting. What is interesting are these uh, structure cards. Um, so again, each person has a monument cards, I mean. So each person has one monument building, which you can place in the second era, and I'll talk about that. So you're going to be handed out three monument cards, and before the second era begins, you will decide which of those monument cards you want to keep. So when we get to the second era, we'll talk about that. Um, these are going to be uh, shuffled and placed face down on top of the board uh, where these um, uh, people are, which I showed before. So let me just quickly show. So you'll see here, so you're going to have people numbered, lettered A, B, C, and D. So you're going to put one face down next to each of those because there are tokens in this bag that have those letters on them. And if you win an area that has one of those letters on it, then you will get to flip over the token next to the person and secretly look at it to see what the point value is on that. So that's basically set up. So now let's talk about how the game plays. Um, but before we do that, there are these keys. So if you are the first person to place all of your buildings, you will get 10 points. And if you are the second person to place all of your buildings, you will get four points. Everyone will end up placing all of their buildings. There's not going to be a situation where a player has not placed their buildings. And I was really worried about that because typically I suck at bidding games. And I was really worried like, oh God, what happens if the game ends and I have all my buildings because I couldn't win any bids. That's not going to happen and I'll explain why. So if it's your turn, let's just suppose I'm starting off the round. I'm going to choose one of my buildings that is available to me in era one. So that means all the buildings that have numbers on them that do not have those dots underneath them. So I will place a building face up, meaning number up onto um, an area, a neighborhood that I want to bid on. Then each player will get the opportunity to bid. So then the next player will get an opportunity to bid. And if they want to bid, they need to go higher than the number that I use to bid. And they have to go into an area, a neighborhood that is adjacent to me. So again, that's where, you know, the lakes might come into effect. That's where the staircases might come into effect because lakes will prevent you from being adjacent to a certain area, perhaps, and so on. Um, so the next player can bid if they want to on an adjacent area. And then the player after that needs to bid on an area adjacent to where that person bid and so on if they choose to bid. And then you continue until in this fashion until someone, until everyone has passed. And then you look at the highest winning bid and then they are the ones who get to flip over the, their building and place it onto that section and collect the token that was there. And then you will slot the token into your player board if it is one of the main colors. So for example, if it's a yellow, green, white, or brown, you'll put it into the first slot in that section. The way that these work is at the end of the game, you're going to see how many tokens you have and that will determine the point value for the building that is in the neighborhood of that color. So for example, if I had four yellow, or sorry, three yellow tokens, that means every building I have would be worth, in a yellow section, would be worth six points. However, if you get too greedy, then you will lose points. However, for each additional token you would collect of that color, you would get 10 points. So it might be worth it to be greedy if you know that you can end up winning areas and collecting tokens beyond four of that color, because then that will be an additional 10 points each, even though 
every building at the end of the game will only be worth four points. So it may pay to be greedy. In our game, that never happened. No one was greedy. No one um, collected more than uh, four tokens in each section. Um, so they were not able to get the additional 10 points. So that's what those tokens are. So again, at the beginning of the game, those are randomly placed out into the neighborhoods. So you get lucky if you manage to win an area in which the token actually matches the neighborhood color, because then you know you already have a building on the neighborhood of that color, and now you have a token that is going to increase that building's value. But of course, that's not always going to be the case. You're going to have many tokens which are on neighborhoods that they do not match. So it's up to you to try to you know, not only meet your own personal objective, but try to, you know, keep these kind of even if you want to, depending on where your buildings are going out um, and where you're placing your buildings. So then once the winner places their building this way up, so then you flip it over and you permanently place your building in the neighborhood, take the token if you want it, then all the other players collect their losing buildings, and then you start again. So now you start with the person who won the last bid and so on. Um, so era one ends once one person has placed all of their arrow one buildings. That means all of the buildings that did not have dots on them. Then era two begins. So at the beginning of era two, you are going to choose which structure, which monument card you want to keep. So again, at the beginning of the game, you were dealt three monument cards and you will decide which of those you want to keep. So these will kind of give you um, kind of some instruction on where you might want to place your monument and it will determine how many points your monument will be worth. So these are going to be public knowledge. Once you decide which monument card you want to keep, these will be public knowledge and everyone will know what you're aiming for, which I'm not sure I completely like that because you can really kind of screw people over and, you know, know exactly what they want, but maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Um, so for example, I had um, the monument card in which I needed to go into the center island. And so every time, you know, it would come to bidding, I would try really hard to manipulate it so that I would eventually be able to place my monument into the center island, but it was really difficult and it did not happen. So, um, I mean, it happened eventually because I was the last person who had not placed all my buildings. So then in the end, I got to place all of my buildings. And again, I'll get into how that works. So yeah, so I had the Olmstead, which says score five if this wonder is constructed on the central island, then score two for every structure on the central island. And that means every structure, not even my own. So it could be other player structures. So if I got my monument on the center island and there were structures here, which there were so I scored two four six plus five for my monument so these monument cards after you select it will determine who goes first in the second era it's going to be the player with the lowest number monument card and they will get to start the bidding in the second era and again you have all of your buildings available to use so you still have your era one buildings to use but now you have your era two buildings and your monuments the way monuments work is you cannot start bidding with a monument but uh, monuments automatically win bidding and will end bidding if placed. So if someone starts bidding with a regular structure, with a regular building, and then someone decides to place down their monument, bidding will immediately end. They will get to place their monument and score their monument immediately, and then you start again. So when you start bidding, you can always start bidding adjacent to an existing structure. It does not have to be adjacent to a structure of your own. So that's something I forgot to mention. So you're going to be like looking all over the islands, trying to find areas as the game progresses that will allow you to immediately claim it. Because sometimes there's not going to be areas adjacent to where you place your building, where you're starting bidding, because they're already occupied, which means you would immediately win that. So as the game is progressing, you're going to have more and more opportunities to bid and immediately claim something. And when you do that, you probably want to do it with a lower level, lower number structure if possible. So you're going to continue in this fashion and then eventually you might get to a point where everyone's placed buildings except for one player because they weren't winning any, bid, any bids. So now they get to one by one start just placing all of their buildings and collecting the tokens and then uh, yeah and then the game ends. So there were some common objectives that players were trying to meet, which would have been scored at the end of era one and then at the again at the end of era two. So for example, one of the common objectives was um, 
lakes in the game I played. Score three for each lake with three plus of your structures bordering it. So if you had a lake that had at least three of your structures uh, next to it, then you would score three points for that lake. So these would score at the end of era one and then again at the end of era two. So once everyone's placed all of their structures and you go to final game scoring, this is how scoring is going to work. So you are going to score area control, island control. And this happened at the end of era one too. Sorry, I forgot to mention this. So you're going to see who has the tallest building in each island at the end of eras one and eras two, era two. So whoever has the tallest building would win that area and they would score the points for that area. If you are tied, then you look at medium sized buildings. Um, so area control, so the player who has the tallest buildings on the island would get five points. Um, if there's still a tie after looking at medium and short buildings, then all the players who are tied would get five points. So you're going to do that at the at the end of era one and again at the end of era two. So you're scoring island control. So you want to try to get your tall buildings out as well as medium buildings to help you break ties. Um, and then you're going to score panorama cards. So again, those are the common objectives that players were trying to meet. So you score those um, at the end of era one and era two. Then you score your secret objectives at the end of era two. So at the end of the game, so if you met your secret objective card, you would get the 10 points from that. And again, those were all similar. So all players were just trying to get four buildings on a certain neighborhood color, basically. Then you score your discs and tiles. So patron discs, again, were the discs that were uh, had a certain letter on them and corresponded to one of these secret numbers at the top of the main board. So if you ever collected a patron disc, you were able to look at what the value was for that patron. So you would then add up all your patron points and so based on, you know, what players might be going for, you might be able to figure out which one was the higher point value one. So the highest value for the patron discs were, was eight, then five, four, and three. Then you score your excess neighborhood disc. So if you had excess neighborhood disc, again, going beyond four, then you would score 10 points for each of those. Um, if you were the first person to place down all of your buildings, you would get the key to the city, which was 10 points. And then the other person would score four points if they were the second person to place down all of their buildings. And then commissions disc. So for each commissions disc, you have score one prestige for every patron disc. So commissions discs were these discs that had a plus one on them. So for each patron disc you had, you would get to add an additional point. Um, I can't find one right now, but it's just a small disc that has a plus one on it. Then you score your structures. Um, so again, you're going to look at how much your structures are worth based on the discs you had. So, you know, based on where your disc is, you'll determine how much a structure in that neighborhood color is worth. And then after all of that is done, you, uh, whoever has the most points is the winner. So that is the game. So it's actually a really easy game to play. Um, you know, so once you learn the rules and you get into it, you know how it's really simple. It's just really, really simple. You're just bidding and it's an area control game. You're just trying to get discs so you can make your buildings worth more, hopefully. And you're trying to, yeah, just, you know, optimize where you place your buildings in order to score the most points. It's a really fun game. I really liked it. And, you know, I think... One of the reasons I really liked it is because of the table presence, because I really, you know, went all out with this game and spent a lot of money on it in order to get all of the upgraded components. Even the score trackers um, are upgraded. So there are these like cool blimps. Super cool. So yeah, I absolutely love the table presence of this game, but I actually really enjoy the gameplay as well. The gameplay is really fun and I would really, really like to play this again soon um, now that I feel like I do have a better grasp on it. But again, it's not difficult at all. You're just bidding and it's an area control game and you know you just have some objectives that you're also trying to meet. So if you like area control games and you're a big fan of miniatures, then I would recommend getting this game because these miniatures are just fantastic. And I feel like all the buildings kind of have a different vibe to them. So I think personally, I think the white buildings or was it the green buildings I thought were the most beautiful. Let me just show you a couple other buildings. But yeah, look at these buildings. They are just so fantastic. The detail on these miniatures. And I'm not typically a miniatures fan, but these buildings are just really, really gorgeous. I absolutely love them. So yeah, so they definitely add to, you know, 
the game when you're playing it. Like it's just really, really stunning. So yeah, so that is Skyrise. So if you like area control games and you like bidding games, then I think you would really, really enjoy this game a lot. And I anticipate that this game will stay in my collection forever just because it is just so freaking stunning. And it's just a really, really fun area control game as well. So that is Skyrise. And if you have any questions, please leave them below and let's move on. So another game I played recently, which I got off of my shelf of shame, is Viticulture Essential Edition. So Viticulture Essential Edition came out in 2015. It's for one to six players. Uh, it's designed by Jamie Stegmeier and Alan Stone, and the art is done by Jackie Davis, David Montgomery, and Beth Sobel, and is published by Stonemeyer Games. Um, so I had this game on my shelf of shame since like 2020, I believe, or 2021. So a very long time. This was a copy which was gifted to me by someone. So it's neither a review copy nor a game that I purchased myself. <laughs> so, um, so this is a very basic kind of worker placement game. So, you know, you can tell it's kind of an older worker placement game because of, excuse me, because of how simple it seems compared to games of today. So basically you're just basically, you know, going to be taking very basic worker placement options. Um, so you are going to have a board, which I'll, you know, throw up a picture of, and you're each going to have your own individual player board. And this is going to keep track of all the grapes you're harvesting and the wines you're making. It's going to keep track of different structures that you can build. There's going to be cards here, and on those cards, we'll, you'll be, pl uh, be placing your grape cards. Uh, so you have different three different fields, and they each have a limit as to how many grape cards you can place into each of them. Um, so for example, like this one, if I had uh, this field card, that would limit me to uh, five, a, a limit of five grapes. Like each of your grape cards is going to have numbers on them and that will kind of, you know, dictate where you can place those cards when you do that. So the main board, and I'm going to throw pictures, but we'll have different areas. And I only played a two player game of this. I think it would probably be more interesting and fun at a higher player count, but it wasn't bad at two players either. Basically, you're just limited to one space in each um, worker spot. So if, if a worker spot is uh, occupied, then you can't go there unless you're using your special big worker and you each person has one special big worker. So, you know, you're basically at the beginning of a round, you're going to place your, you know, depending on player order, you're going to place your hen, your rooster over here, and that will determine what you'll get at the um at the end of each season or maybe it was the beginning of each no at the end of each season so like for example um at the end of summer if you had placed your rooster in the second row which means if you were higher up than the other players roosters then you would be first in turn order and placing your workers out and then at the end of the season you would get one coin so these will kind of give you some kind of a bonus when the season ends so the game takes place over each round takes place over four seasons so you have spring summer fall and winter but your season might end sooner than someone else's season and the board is divided into those seasons so for example this is spring this is summer this is fall and that's winter so the worker spots that are available to you are different in each season so like for example in one season you might want to you know grab some grape cards and then in another season you might want to plant those cards um so you know there's some worker spots that you're definitely going to want to go to which will be taken so you're trying to optimize where you place your workers and how you get to grow your grapes and harvest them and then turn them into wine and then sell them so there's different kinds of cards in this game so there's going to be grape cards there's going to be these order fulfillment cards there's a bunch of different kinds of cards in this game and there's going to be cards in which you're just trying to you know, that give you special abilities, for example, like these blue cards, uh, this one says gain one coin for each card in your hand or discard your hand minimum of one card to gain two points. So blue cards will give you some kind of a special ability. Um, so if you manage to get those, you know, then you'll have to go to a certain worker spot in order to play that card. Um, the yellow cards, um, it looks like they also give you some kind of a special ability. Um, the green cards are the grape cards. Let me just show you some of those. So for example, uh, here is a grape card. So it'll give you value one 
in, of both yellow and rather white of white and red grapes. Um, so, and then, it, you know, some of these will tell you what kind of a structure you need um, unlocked in order to even um, plant those grapes. So some grapes you cannot even plant unless you have the structure needed. So for example, um, and everyone starts with a trellis. So the trellis everyone will start with, but for example, this one, you can't plant this higher level three red grape unless you have this structure built. Um, so you'll have wanted to build, you'll have, you'll have hopefully built that before trying to play this card. Um, and then you have these fulfillment cards. So you're trying to get wines of different levels so that you can fulfill these and get the rewards listed on the bottom. And sometimes you're going to want to make like champagne or something instead of wine. So for example, here, you're going to want, I think it's called champagne, um, the pink ones, but I cannot be 100% sure. So there's different fulfillment cards. And again, you'll be collecting these in different spaces and being able, you'll be able to uh, play them in different spaces. So the purple cards you can only do in winter and you have to go to the fill space with a worker in order to do that. Um, there's also an element of area control going on in this game. So there's this area at the bottom where you can play stars and if you place one of your star tokens there, you'll get the bonus that's listed there. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most stars in that section will get the number of points that's listed there. Um, so I know I didn't show you everything, but like here is the box and I can try to show you all of the components inside. Um, so all the money, the money is really nice and thick and it's uh, cardboard, but they're really big. <laughs> like for example, look at this five, it's huge. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, this is the first player marker, these grapes, cute. Um, and then, you know, different workers. So for example, this is the big worker, which I mentioned everyone has. So if you have a big worker, that can go on a spot that is already occupied, which I think is really necessary in a two-player game. You only start with a minimum, a certain number of workers based on your starting cards, and then you can uh, hire more workers by going to certain work, uh, certain spot in the, in the, on the board if you need to. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially the game. It's a very basic worker placement game in which you're just trying to plant your grapes and then harvest your grapes, create wine, and sell that wine, and then uh, the game end will be triggered uh, once someone has reached 25 points, and then you'll see who has the most points, that so you'll finish the you know, the seasons, and then whoever has the most points will win. So yeah, it's a really basic work replacement game, but sometimes it's really nice to play something simple in a world where we now have games that combine multiple mechanics into one game, and there's a lot to keep track of. So I'm really happy that my friend suggested we play this game, and I was finally able to get it off of my shelf of shame. It's a really nice, uh, simple, like classic kind of work replacement game. So I can see why people really like it, and it took me forever to play it, but now I know why why people are a huge fan of viticulture. So yeah, so that was viticulture. So let's move on. Another game I played recently is Color Field. So this is a 2024 game for two to four players designed by Mondo Davis. The art is done by Priscilla Benitez and is published by 25th Century Games. This was a review copy that I received. So in this game, this is basically a pattern building, an abstract pattern building game with an art theme. So it says, it's time to paint your masterpiece. Choose paint tiles to add to your canvas as you compose three beautiful abstract paintings in this game. Match colors on the top to score points as you create these stunning works of art. So you are basically taking on the role of an abstract painter. So I'm going to first talk about how this game plays and then I will give my review of this game. So you are going to have this one um, board in the center which is going to have tiles placed onto it from which you will be drafting to place onto your own board. So at the beginning of the game you are going to be covering your board with foundation tiles. So the foundation tiles all are of different types and you'll see that they you know have different colors on them and stuff and you're going to always place them with the arrow pointing up. So randomly you're going to take these foundation tiles and place them onto your board and throughout the game you're basically going to be collecting paint tiles and you're going to be covering up your foundation tiles and hopefully in order to match colors and also create um, a big area of one color if you can in order to score you know points at the end of the round for that um, and you will have like these inspiration tokens which will hopefully allow you to you know do something different if you need to so in round one each person is going to take five turns and then in round two each person will take four turns and then in round three each player will take four turns 
Um, so basically, on your turn, you will either select one of the palette, um, the art tiles from the board, like here. Um, so there's going to be draw piles for the different rounds. So there's round one tiles, then round two tiles, and round three tiles. And some of these will have numbers on certain colors. So for example, here's a tile that has a number two on the yellow. So if you actually match up this yellow to another yellow, you'll actually score two points instead of one point, which you would typically score. So you're basically priming your canvas, as I said, by placing foundation tiles to each empty space um, and then on your board. And then you're going to start painting. So on your turn, you can choose a paint tile from the three tiles that are revealed on the palette board, or you can draw the top uh, tile without looking at it and then you decide if you want to place it onto your canvas or if you want to place it on a card which says discard so you will have like a discard pile um, of your own that you can discard tiles to if you want um, so you can rotate the new tile so that it's pointing in any direction but once it's placed you cannot move it or rotate it again unless you use an inspiration token so again, if you don't want to place a tile you drew, then you send it to the discard space on your player card instead. And those will be worth negative points unless um, you are playing the advanced version where they might be actually worth positive points. So we played the advanced version of this game where there were some of these cards in play uh, each round. So there would be a special card in play each round and one of them um, actually uh, made the discard tiles score points instead of subtract points, which I cannot find it right now. But yeah, but here each, is each person's discard pile. So you'll each have a discard pile if you want to discard tiles. Um, so yeah, so if you use an inspiration, um, that would allow you to adjust your canvas. So you in a uh, so if you're playing the basic game, you only have three inspiration tokens. If you're playing the advanced game, then you'll have extra inspiration tokens, two more, I believe. Um, so you can use an inspiration token at any time. You flip it from the face up uh, to face down to indicate that it's been used. And that will allow you to either rotate a tile in the same spot that it's in or swap the positions of two tiles, but not rotate them. So those are inspiration tiles. Then at the end of the round, you're going to score for matching paint tile edges. So, you know, if there's a match, you'll score one point. If there's no match, you won't score anything. But again, some tiles will score you two points if there's a number two or even a number three in uh, the higher, the later rounds. Um, and then you're also going to score for your largest patch. So you'll score one point for each um, thing that contributes to the largest patch. So if there's like, you know, if there's three tiles and then two edges of the board contributing to that, that's going to be five points basically for your largest patch if you manage to do that. Um, and then you're going to reset and start for the next round. So your position, your point value will determine how many uh, tiles you can keep on your canvas. Otherwise you empty the canvas and you're starting fresh with uh, new foundation tiles and then you're going to be drafting new paint tiles. So that's essentially how the game plays. So the game will end at the end of round three and then whoever has the most points from all three rounds is going to be the winner. Um, so again, I did play with advanced play which gives you community tool cards, uh, which you'll reveal at the beginning of each round, which will give you the player some kind of an ability or some kind of a scoring bonus of some kind. So it doesn't you know, add a whole lot, but it just makes things a little bit more interesting Interesting. So in terms of this, uh, you know, how I feel about this game. So I played a two player game of this and both me and my opponent were very bored while playing this. Um, so, you know, I'm very grateful to have gotten the opportunity to play this and received a review copy of it. So I will say that my next game that I'm going to be discussing afterwards is also from 25th Century game, Games and I really enjoy that. So, you know, there is going to be a positive review coming up. But for this, I had to give it a five on BGG just because I could not see myself ever wanting to play this again in terms of, you know, tile placement, in terms of abstract games, in terms of art themed games. I just feel like there are games that do it so much better and are actually fun to play or actually interesting that this just did not interest me at all. I just found it really boring. I just you know, I just couldn't wait for it to be over, to be honest. And it turns out that my opponent felt the same way. Um, so there was a review that someone had posted of this game on BGG, and um, I actually really agree with everything that this player, this person said. So I'm just going to re read this review. Um, so, you know, there are people who enjoy this game, and, you know, games are very subjective, of course. 
So this person said, for a game with such high quality production, and it is pretty high quality production, I mean, these tiles, the components, everything are super nice. It pains me to say that the game is fine. Agree, it's just fine. Um, I don't have any real complaints about gameplay, but there really isn't much to praise about it either. Agree. Um, which is a shame for a deluxe edition that was on Kickstarter. While the game isn't a dis disappointing one, the fact that it doesn't have the wow factor of the other two 25th century board games that were in this bundle is a disappointment. I'm sure with repeated plays, I'll come to enjoy the serenity of rearranging my thick linen finished tiles while sipping my coca on a uh, Coco on a cool autumn evening. I think I just need to get over what color field is not and wrap myself in a warm blanket of what color field could be. Still a five though. That's exactly how I feel about this. Maybe I had higher expectations and that's why I was let down. Maybe in a world filled with tile placement games, art themed games that I find a lot more fun, for example like Canvas, or there's like a billion tile placement games in which you're trying to arrange things and that are abstract that I think are much more interesting it was a letdown for me like it was a it was you know it's not a game that I could see myself coming back to to be honest so I'm actually going to be donating this to the flag con library which is a local game convention that I helped to organize um, so I helped organize it last year and then we're going to have our second convention coming up in Ithaca um, in November in case anyone is interested so yeah, so unfortunately it was a letdown for me, but again, the components are very nice, um, but you know, you know, it just didn't interest me. Like abstract art, sure, but like the colors just kind of seem bland to me as well. Maybe if they like, I don't know, did something a little bit more with the artwork or the colors on the tiles, maybe I'd be a bit more interested. I don't know, but, um, but it just didn't do it for me. So it's not staying in my collection and um, yeah, so that is color field. But I will talk about another 25th century game that I did like after this one. So let's move on. <laughs> Let's talk about French Quarter. So French Quarter is a 2024 game for one to four players designed by Adam Hill, Ben Pinchback, and Matt Riddle. And the art is done by Marlies Behrens and Snow Conrad. And it's published by Motor City Gameworks and 25th Century Games. And I match. Look at this. It's so pretty. Oh, I love New Orleans, by the way. So this is a really good... Um, uh, roll and write game. I'm a huge fan of these kinds of games. I absolutely love their games by the same designers, Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. I absolutely love Fleet the Dice game and Three Sisters and now this one. Um, out of all of their games that they've come out with, um, Motor City was fine too, but considering the theme, I wasn't a huge fan of it, but this is my favorite so far. I really, really enjoyed this. So I played a solo game of it, um, but basically you are going to have two sheets and on one sheet you're going to have like a map of New Orleans with different buildings on them and then over here you're just going to have different kinds of, um, I don't know what they're called exactly, um, like uh, activities, yes, activity tracks. So you'll have different kinds of activity tracks. So you're going to have dice and then depending on player count you'll, you know, roll a certain number of dice and there's going to be a certain number of colors. Um, and then you're going to have your own player tokens and you are going to need a meeple because you'll be moving your meeple around on your map. So this game is a little bit different than previous games in which you're going to have meeples. And if you play with the mayor, in which is uh, in a solo game I did need to do, certain roads might be blocked off. So you'll have these block, um, these uh, pieces that will block off certain roads if you need to do that as well. And of course, the first player token is a fleur de lis, which in my game, obviously, I didn't need. But here are the pieces that will block off certain roads if you need to do that. And of course, all of the pieces in this game are thematic. So your meeple will be thematic. If uh, So you have like a, an umbrella, you have like an alcohol drink here, a saxophone it looks like, or a trumpet or something like that. So yeah, so you're going to have different cards and the different cards will uh, be of different transportation types. So for example, you'll have carriage, you'll have walking, you'll have streetcar, you'll have a uh, riverboat, you'll, sorry, that's not the word, here's the riverboat, you'll have the socializing and you'll have um, the mayor cards if you play with the mayor. Um, and taxi cards. Since I played a solo game of this, I did not use taxi, but I did play with the mayor cards, which you have to do in a solo game. So basically you're going to roll the dice and then um, flip over one of these cards, which will show you various symbols on them and show you the move action that you'll be taking and so on. And you'll get to fill in the symbols and you'll be moving around on the map of the 
you know, on your map and trying to place in different numbers in the different buildings. So the numbers you're placing will be the die value that was rolled. So you're going to take turns selecting a card and then doing your build action, your move action, and your building action. And it's basically just a very combo tastic game. Like, so, you know, just like the other games, based on what you're doing, you're going to end up triggering other things. You'll end up like filling bubbles here and then that might allow you to fill more bubbles and do more things and you're just basically, you know, um, you know, continuing this whole comboing business that you're doing in order to score the most points. Um, so, you know, I won't go into too much detail of how it plays because, um, you know, I think with this kind of a game, it's uh, something that you'll figure out as you're playing. Um, after you read the rule books, but going through it right now would be quite tedious because again, it's a very combo tastic game. But basically you have different activity tracks and you know, you might end up filling activity bubbles and then that might allow you to score additional points uh, depending on how many you fill. There's umbrellas, there's like different performer sets. So you're also trying to do some set collection here. You're going to have various buildings that you're filling here. So um, yeah, so that's basically it. So at the end of the game, you're just going to be scoring like your activities, you'll score your buildings, your performers, your umbrellas, and all of that, and bonuses if you had them and stuff like that. And then whoever has the most points will win. Of course, if you're playing a solo game, it's a beat your own score kind of thing, which is fine for me. Um, I really just enjoy the comboing and stuff going on and it's just so pretty and it just brings back memories of New Orleans. I just really like the components in this game and everything too. So if you have enjoyed their past games and that's why I laminated the sheets because um, you know, I this is a game that I would definitely laminate sheets so that I don't you know go through the whole pad very quickly because it's the kind of game I anticipate playing multiple times because this is the kind of game that I really enjoy playing solo. So if you enjoy flip and write games, uh, or roll and write games and you enjoy combo tastic games then highly recommend this one i think it's my most favorite out of all the games that they've done so far um the the roll and writes and flip and writes and i think it's the prettiest i think it's the most thematic of the games that they've done so far so this is my number one from motor city gameworks and 25th century games for these flip and write series so yeah definitely recommend this if you like flip and writes roll and writes and if you like New Orleans and if you're looking just for a small box game, you can play solo. It's really nice to just sit and play solo. So yeah, so that is French Quarter. So let's move on. Let's talk about Aqua, Biodiversity in the Oceans. This is a 2024 game for one to four players designed by Dan Halstead, Tristan Halstead, and the art is done by Vincent Detroit and it's published by Sidekick Games. This is a copy which I purchased used from um, Millennium Games. Um, so yeah, so um, using store credit. So if you've ever played the game Acropolis, uh, very similar to Acropolis, I would say, but maybe more difficult than Acropolis. So I played a two-player game of this. I'm just going to throw pictures, but basically you're going to have a starting tile and you're going, so pretty, look at how pretty that is. And you're going to be just drafting various tiles to place and, you know, fulfill different kinds of patterns. And you're trying to fulfill different patterns because based on, um, the patterns that you're making, you'll get to collect different types of animals and you're going to want to place the animals uh, on top of the patterns that you completed based on what the requirements were. So there's going to be small animals, like small fish and then bigger kinds of fish. And I don't know where all the small fishies and stuff are. Huh, I thought there were like small animals, but maybe I'm wrong. So yeah, I thought there were small animal types Oh yeah, there are. So I just can't find them here, but like, oh, here they are. So, so for example, like these, these are the smaller animals and then you're going to uh, be trying to place those and then you're going to be trying to place even bigger animals on top of them if you meet the pattern requirements. And so I'm not going to go into too much detail about how it plays, but it's very similar to like Acropolis in which you're just placing tiles and just trying to create various patterns and being mindful of the scoring conditions and how different things are going to score in the end and trying to get these bigger animals, which are def definitely going to be harder to get. It's a much harder game than Acropolis because um, the way in which uh, you can collect the animals is a lot harder to do than 
how you would um, collect tiles in Acropolis and thus scoring is going to be harder to do. So you're creating different types of habitats and reefs and then you're establishing biodiversity. So large animals have to be placed on top of at least one small animal that you placed in that turn and large animals must rest completely on top of small animals. So you can't have them just on top of like a coral type or something like that. So I just uh, felt like this game was difficult um, but it's one I'm going to keep in my collection for now because I I think it's one that is challenging and maybe with more plays I might be able to uh, know how to play it better. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, and then it comes with different scenarios and stuff that you can, uh, I think, complete as well. I don't know. It says extra objectives. Um, yeah, I don't think for the first few plays you're going to need extra objectives because I think it's a, a bit difficult in order to try to score large animals. Um, so yeah, so you're just trying to collect small animals and then large animals and you're also adding up reefs like the, you know, connected uh, colors of the same kind and so on. And, but yeah, you're just creating ecosystems and stuff. And then at the end, you're going to score your ecosystems. So for the different kinds of animals, um, you'll score different kinds of points and stuff like that. So it's a lot to keep in mind as you're playing. Like I feel like um, as I'm playing, I'm not going to be able to, able to keep in mind all the different ways in which things will score. I'm more, in, you know, trying to keep in mind like, okay, I need this animal and this one and this one, then I can get that big animal. Like, there's just a lot to keep track of, I think, if you really want to score really well in this game. But yeah, it's one that I would play again, and I know that was a really terrible explanation. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm sure that if it sounds some, like something that you're interested in, you can maybe go learn more information about it. I played it a couple weeks ago, so my memory is also a little bit um, not the best right now in terms of how to play. But it's basically a tile drafting tile placement game. Uh, similar to Acropolis in which you're going to have different levels but more difficult than Acropolis in terms of scoring I would say. Like I really enjoy Acropolis and I find it a little bit easier to understand and play than this game. So yeah so that was Aqua so let's move on. Okay let's go into games that I am backing or that I have received. Um, for some reason, Kickstarter is just showing me a bunch of confetti. I don't know what that's about, but okay. Um, so the games that I am currently backing, I went a little bit Kickstarter crazy again. Ugh, I know it's terrible, um, but I am backing this game called Garden Geckos, which looks really cute. Um, so Garden Geckos uh, is expensive. I'm backing like the deluxe edition of it, I guess. Um, so it's like 60, how much is it? God, it's expensive. It's 60 Canadian dollars, which is about 45 US dollars. Um, so it's got super cute like gecko meeples and stuff like that. It's like a tile placement game with really cute geckos and bugs in it. Um, it just looks adorable. I really wanted the plush, but then the plush uh, gecko was like, it said it would add another $10 to shipping. And I'm like, okay, I don't need the plush that badly. Like, cause you have to pay for the plush and then pay another $10 just to get the plush. Um, so yeah, I'm not getting the super cute gecko plush though, oh, but he is really adorable. Anyway, so yeah, so this just looks really fun. Um, I saw a couple reviews of it on like Instagram and here and there, so and it got good reviews and the geckos just look really cool. And I don't think I have any games with geckos in them, like not as like the main like animal, you know what I mean? So, and the gecko meeples are just awesome. So that has, uh, 540 backers right now. It's on Kickstarter for another 23 days. Um, as far as I remember, it backed within the first day. Um, so, so far it's raised about $27,000. So that is Garden Geckos. It's, it says a puzzly tile lane game of geckos and bugs in a garden. So I'm backing that. And then I'm backing um, Awkward Guess 2. So I really like the first Awkward Guess. Um, and the second one looks really interesting. Uh, and it just adds some cool new stuff, I think. So it's um, it's a deduction game. So if you like deduction games, I think you would enjoy it. Um, so it says it's a game of dice, mystery, and deduction that offers you the challenge of not only solving the homicide of one of the Berwick twins, but also of orchestrating the murder of the other one. So in each of the cases, you will lead a different role. And in one case, you will be the mastermind that orchestrates the murder of one of the twins, while in the other case, you will be the investigator who tries to solve the murder of the other twin. So it looks really interesting. It just looks really fun. I like the whole aesthetic of the 
game. I love the aesthetic of the first one as well, um, but this looks really good and it's got dice in it as well. So I'm backing this and it's, you know, I'm backing it for the uh, Swift Investigator level, which also includes um, some additional like uh, um, companion books of some kind. Um, so there's a Awkward Secrets companion book and then there's um, another book I think maybe it has some additional cases or something in it so yeah so I'm backing that so it's a uh, at the tw it's 27 euros so about 30 dollars so I'm backing that as well and then I still have my pledge of River Valley Glassworks so like I said I went a little bit Kickstarter crazy so this is a lot more than I feel like I typically have backed at one point in time because none of these are review copies. They're copies that I'm just going to be paying full price for. And of course I'm a completionist and always want the deluxe versions. So yeah, so it's a lot, uh, but that's what I'm backing right now. So now let's go on to stuff that I've received. The first thing I'll show is um, something that I backed myself. So if you guys have seen my videos before on Dog Park, you know that I always feel like Dog Park is just missing something. So I'm not sure that this expansion will add a lot to it or fix my issues with the game. Like I feel like Dog Park could have used another round or two and I don't know that this will necessarily solve that um, but I because I am a completionist I had backed um, Dog Park New Tricks and so that arrived. So let's see so here is the box. So yeah it looks like just um, some new tokens and a bunch of different new cards which, oh, it smells so good. I love that new board game smell. Oh my God, it smells so, so good. Yes, okay, so let me just show you some of the cards. They actually managed to come out of their little card holder thing. So yeah, I don't know how, that's a location card. Um, so I don't know how New Tricks plays yet, but I think I would like to try Dog Park. I've played Dog Park maybe three times, something like that. So I wonder what this adds to it. Um, so yeah, oh, that's a pretty dog. Is that a Shiwi Inu? No, that's a Chow, no, what kind of Chow, Chow, Chowski? It's a Chowski dog? Oh no, that's not, is that the name of the breed? No, well maybe that is the name of the breed. Interesting. So yeah, so this came in and there's like a whole bunch of other cards which I'm not going to show you and it comes with this cute little insert. Um, really digging the pink, really like the pink color of the insert. Oh, and then all these cool tokens and more things. Um, so yeah, so really looking forward to this. Oh, these are so pretty. I've always loved the colors in this game. They are just so, so pretty, like these pastel colors. So yeah, so I backed this and this arrived. And I looks like I also got some other additional stuff for this game. So I also look, it looks like I backed Dogs of the World expansion. And then new tricks upgrade pack. So it includes screen printed wooden dog reputation marker and 28. Huh. I feel like I already had the wooden resources in here. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. But it looks like I backed this. I wonder if this was necessary for me to back as well. I hope I didn't misread things and have extras. But yeah. I wonder if that was already included in the box because if it was then oops okay <laughs> so um now i'm curious so yeah so this arrived um what else oh and toffee is being a bad boy and just open that up okay and uh so i got my review copies of a game that i had covered previously for its kickstarter which was uh, Ataria Septachroma, The Stones of Genesis, which is a two-player abstract strategy game, which was really good. So I got my um, production copy of that, which is really nice. Um, so, you know, if you want to know how it plays, you can go find the um, video that I did of that for that. And then they also sent me their other game, which was in the same Kickstarter campaign, but I did not cover, which is a, so that was a two player game. And this one is for two to four players, I believe. So this is Ataria Elvian Relics. So they sent me this as well, which was nice of them. Um, I did not cover this for its Kickstarter, but it includes like these cool big dice and it has these cool cards and just you know some punch out stuff and some meeples um so no idea how this plays but you know eventually i'll get to it <laughs> so and talk about it 
Oh no, I left this out. Oops, I hate when I do that. Okay, so those were the games that I received. I don't think that there's anything else at the moment. So let's move on. Time to pick an obsession giveaway winner. So we didn't receive that many entries. So as you can see on the spreadsheet, the entrants are numbered three to 16. So your chances of winning are pretty good. So we are going to go to a random number generator. And when I bring up a random number generator, it already shows one through 10 and a number seven there. So we're just gonna put in the numbers we need, which are three to 16. And we are going to hit generate. And the number that came up is number eight, which is Kadian. Oh, let me show you the number first, sorry. <laughs> so number eight came up and number eight is Kadian O'Reilly. So let me just show you here. So as you can see, number eight is Kadian O'Reilly. So congratulations, Kadian, because you just won everything Obsession, which is pretty dang amazing. Um, at least I think it's amazing because Obsession is such an awesome game. Um, so a huge congratulations to you, Kadian. So I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Kadian. Um, so I am going to uh, give your details. Once I get your details, rather, I need your email address. Um, so if you can email me at boardgamesinaminute at gmail.com with your email address, and um, I will pass that along to Dan Halligan for you to receive everything Obsession. So super excited for you. I hope you enjoy this game as much as I do. I absolutely love it. And for all the rest who did not win, I am so sorry. And I hope that I will get to do giveaways more often. So rather than wait until the 200th video, which is two years from now, I would like to do another giveaway at 150, which is a year from now. And of course, before then, if I get the chance. So I will reach out to publishers and find reasons to do giveaways if they are willing to sponsor them because that would be nice. I think I would love for everyone who follows me to win something. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know if that's possible, but it would be really, really great if everyone who, you know, is subscribed to my channel could eventually win something. I would really, really love that. So, so congratulations again, Katie and O'Reilly, um, because, you know, you're going to be getting everything obsession. But for the rest of you, please don't feel sad. I will you know, do everything I can to do more giveaways um, going forward. So thank you for supporting my content. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. So let's move on. So a quick cat update. So I we have started to see cats at the third colony. So I actually um, there's two other people who help feed that colony because otherwise I would go completely broke. So there are two other girls who are really nice and they help feed at that colony. And now all of us have had cat sightings at the third colony. And that is a colony that I said has really feral cats. So I think that they're starting to trust us more and more and are starting to wait for the food, which is really exciting. So, um, you know, because eventually we want to trap them and move them to a safer location. We want to relocate all of them because this is the colony that is kind of located near like an overpass, like a highway. So we definitely want to, be able to gain their trust so that we can hopefully trap them a little bit easier and then um, move them. So super exciting. Um, the other colonies are doing well. It is such a beautiful day outside right now. So I'm really looking forward to going and seeing the cats because it always makes me happy to see them outside and enjoying themselves on a really nice day. So hopefully winter is officially over. I really, really hope so because I am sick of shoveling snow at the colonies and of course my own driveway, <laughs> but especially at the colonies, it just makes it a lot harder to take care of them and stuff and for their own sake I just want them to be happy and warm and you know content so yeah so that is the cat colony update so I think that's it so let's move on so um since I talk about Palestine in every video there's really not much left to say I mean what is there left to say um things are just terrible we had um that world kitchen <coughs> attacked deliberately attacked like after you know so their food truck um food vans 
were attacked and you had people who were volunteering with this food kitchen to try to feed Palestinians. And so some of the volunteers, of course, were white people from Western countries. And what happened when these people were deliberately killed by Israel? Now you have news agencies and other people speaking up about what's happening in Palestine, saying how terrible this is. So 40,000 dead Palestinians was not enough to get people to speak up. But once a white person is killed, trying to deliver food to these Palestinians, then these agencies speak up. Now people are speaking up and expressing outrage. Like that just shows you that the value of Arab lives and Palestinian lives is just zero to these people. Like our lives, the values, the, you know, Muslim lives, Arab lives, Palestinian lives are meaningless to most of the world our lives have no value to most of the world. So most of the world stayed silent until these humanitarian workers were killed, deliberately killed by Israel. And, you know, I don't know what proof people need to, you know, see that everything they do is so deliberate. Like, there, you know, if you believe that these things are accidental, then you are willfully blind. You are choosing to remain ignorant. You are choosing to side with the oppressor if you believe that this was accidental. There is countless proof out there that it was not accidental. The first van that they were in was attacked. And then when they tried to save themselves by going to another vehicle, then that vehicle was targeted and um, blown up. And then when they tried to leave that one and go to another one, then that one was targeted and then they were all killed. So, I mean, the evidence is there for every atrocity that the Israelis have committed to show you that everything is deliberate and still you have people trying to convince the world that it's not deliberate. But oh no, Hamas was there, Hamas was there, Hamas was in the hospital. Like no, the truth is out there and if you care about the truth you can go and find it so easily. Um, so please, you know, go follow Palestinian creators who have been talking about this since the beginning and listen to their voices, amplify their voices and if you care about, you know, human rights, and if you truly care about all human rights, I urge you to support content creators in this industry who show you that they also care about all human rights and not just white people or not just black people or whatever is the in thing to care about. So, you know, just follow people who have a conscience, follow people who are true to their words, show that they, you know, um, show that show actions rather than just words like don't follow people you know i would say don't follow people who are just words and no actions which you know is a lot of people in this industry and you know i think one of the reasons they hate me so much is because i always try to put actions to my words and if i say i care about something then i'm gonna go and actually do the thing show the thing you know show some thing that i've done to show that i actually care about it i'm not going to just sit there and talk about it i'm actually going to put actions to my words and i think that that you know you know, people don't like that because then it kind of threatens them. It prevents them from just being able to just sit there and do nothing but type on Twitter and pretend that they care. And, you know, and then the world can see that, no, you don't care because you're not actually doing anything. So, you know, please try to follow creators who actually care about things. And that goes for board game publishers too. And try to avoid publishers who support a genocide and try to avoid content creators who support a genocide like Quackalope. So Quackalope, if you look at his personal Instagram account, which is called a Jewish take, um, he follows a bunch of genocide loving people like Ben Shapiro, like that one rabbi, uh, Manus Friedman, who was recently, you know, Manus Friedman has said a lot of really horrible things, including about how it's okay to kill Palestinian babies because they're basically terrorists. Like there are no innocent civilians and that includes babies. So he's encouraging the killing of babies. Um, and, you know, these are people that Quackalope follows. Like Ben Shapiro, you know, there was once upon a time I didn't know who Ben Shapiro was and maybe it would have been better if it stayed that way. But then I learned who he was and he's just a really awful human being as well. <laughs> so, and these are the people that Quackalope supports. So, you know, be mindful of the creators that you are watching and supporting who support genocide. Um, so please just, you know, there's like nothing left to say. I'm just tired. I'm just really, really tired. And if I'm tired, 
you know, I can't even begin to imagine how the Palestinian people feel. If you guys are sick of listening to me, just imagine how the Palestinian people feel who are living this day in and day out for six months. It's been six months of an ongoing genocide that they have been dealing with day in and day out. And if you are sick of listening to me, and if I'm tired just talking about it, like it's exhausting, then just think about them. Think about what they have to go through. Like even the most basic things such as taking a shower, going to the bathroom in the privacy of my own bathroom. Like when I'm, you know, it's maybe that's a TMI, but I often think about what the Palestinians have to deal with. Like when I get to go to my own personal bathroom, use it in the comfort of my own home, it's clean because I'm, you know, really big on cleanliness. I can't even imagine what these people have to go through when they don't have the facilities to use that they need. They can't take showers. They are literally starving to death. Like, can you just imagine what that life is like? So just be grateful for everything that you have and just please support creators who have shown that they actually care about what's going on. And the big names in this industry who still remain silent about this genocide, like Eric Lang, Suzanne Sheldon, Rodney Smith, and all the others who have previously given shit to people for not caring about the issues that they care about, for following you know, publishers that they don't want people to follow because they're supposedly against BLM, Black Lives Matter, or against women's rights and all of that. And now they remain dead silent during this ongoing genocide. It's been six months and they have not said a word in six months. So just be mindful of who you support in this industry and be mindful of the fact that some people are all just talk and no actions. And just, you know, I just hope people will be mindful of who they support. That's all I can say. I'm just sorry getting a headache. Um, but yeah, so that's all I can say. And I don't think that there's much left to say at this point. So, so I've already gone on for seven minutes when I said I had nothing to say. So I think I will end that and move on. So this week's question of the week is inspired by Skyrise. It's two questions actually, and maybe the answer to both questions will be the same. Um, I want to know what is your favorite area control game and what is your favorite game with miniatures in it? So I never thought I would be someone who likes miniatures, but in this game, I actually like them because number one, um, you know, they're not excessive. It's not like a box with like a hundred some miniatures in it. And I'm not a painter, so I'm not gonna sit there painting a hundred miniatures. Um, so this one, they come pre-washed. They look like such cool buildings. So I have nothing to do in order to make them look nicer. And you know, they actually make the board look really cool like the table presence they actually serve a purpose in this game they look really awesome so I actually really really like them in this game but typically I'm not someone who likes miniatures but in this game I really really like them and I want to know what is your favorite area control game because this was a really fun easy area control game so I want to know what are some of your favorite area control games and what are some of your favorite games with miniatures if you like miniatures um, but again, I'm not into games that are super miniature heavy, especially not ones that you have to paint yourself because I'm not a painter and I'm like one of those people, if I start something, I have to finish it and then it would just be, you know, a long time before I would even get to play the game in that case because God knows how long it would take me to paint miniatures and I just don't have the time for that. So anyway, so those are the questions of the week and until next week, bye! <music>